Hey bosses, this week's sponsor is Fundrise, bringing you the future of real estate investing. Get started for as little as $1,000 at investlikeaboss.com slash fundrise. Find out more during the break. Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey guys, it's Johnny, and welcome to episode 52 of the Best Like a Boss podcast. And I'm actually sitting here in person live next to Sam Marks. It's good to be back together. It's been since August of last year that we were able to record an episode. And uh, funny enough, we're back in Europe, kick off the summer, and it's just great. And this week we have an incredible guest as well. Yeah, and actually, to kind of kick that off, we are having Spanish wine. Mm-hmm. Here in Barcelona, and I know some of you guys have missed us drinking on the episode, so uh, I'm excited to bring you this week's guest. We're gonna have Phil Town, who is a hedge fund manager. And the reason I'm so excited to to bring him on is everything that that we've we've talked about has always been tr- you know not trying to beat the market, but just trying to preserve capital or just you know um, mimic the market with index funds and uh, things you know things like uh, funds in Vanguard, but hedge fund managers or hedge funds are actually the only type of vehicle that can push the, and beat the market. So I'm really excited to kind of pick his brain about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a fantastic episode to kind of chase the Wealthfront episode with Andy Rockliffe. Uh, great episode with Andy Rockliffe. And one thing that Andy kept alluding to in the episode was that there are all these managers out there that constantly outperform the market. And I was actually really surprised to hear him say that. And Phil's one of them. And the, the style of investing he does has constantly beaten the market. And we're going to learn a lot about that on this episode. And this is an episode you guys don't want to miss. Phil's got an incredible story, started in the U.S. Special Forces, became a rafting guide afterwards and fell into finance in such a unique and almost magical way. And he famously turned $1,000 into over a million in just under five years of getting into finance using these methods. So I'm excited for this episode. I know you are, Sam. And I think everyone listening to this will definitely learn a lot. So let's get into this episode of Phil Town. Hey, bosses. Have you ever wanted to invest in real estate but didn't want the headache or risk of becoming a landlord? Well, Fundrise may be the answer. They allow you to earn passive income while they do the work. Get started today and skip the waitlist by using our special partner link at investlikeyourboss.com slash Fundrise. Everybody, welcome back. Today we have on the show someone I've been looking forward to having on for quite some time, Mr. Phil Town. Phil, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, Sam, great to be here. Love it. All right. All right. And just before we get started, man, I wanted to give you a very quick shout out. I know you're a previous military guy and wanted to thank you for your service and the Green Beret. You're the first person I've ever met that served in the Green Beret. Oh, my gosh. Well, there's um, there's thousands of their, these guys out there and they're usually a lot quieter about it than I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you don't ever know. You don't ever know. But it, it's it's out there. And um, I, I just want to put it in balance that that the uh, special operations people across the United States and whether they're Green Berets or SEALs or Marine uh, Force Recon or the Air Force Parajump guys, all, all these guys are just uh, – and and women now are starting to move into these areas. And mm-hmm. I'll tell you, they're just such incredible people. We love working with them still. And I spent a little bit of time in special forces, but these guys have careers in there. And all I, all I just want to say really is that – their lives are so precious to us, and we should just be very, very careful where we get ourselves into. You know, it's just yeah. like we just can't keep sending these guys off yeah. in any old place. You know, they're really valuable people. So the best of the best and the best of America, for sure. Exactly. Well, I know you're up in Atlanta. So I was actually just about five or six years ago, we built a really small house up, uh, and it's in a place called Westminster up near Clemson. Yeah, that's a Coney, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. on Lake, Lake Hartwell, right, kind of smudged South right in bet- between. Yep, yeah, yeah, right in between the borders of uh, of Georgia and South Carolina. There's a little is there a little river that goes there. I was thinking about canoeing one day. Is it kind of nice? Are you guys right there? I I lo- I, th- I think it's it's one of my favorite areas in the U.S. I've been doing a, a lot of exploring in the U.S. the last couple of years, just trying to figure out. I'm, I'm originally from Florida, and Florida's boring to me at this point. Um, so been going all across the U.S. trying to find you know where I want to 
set up roots and that area kind of Atlanta North it, there's there's a, a great vineyard scene that's uh, emerging now. Uh, we met we we're at all these vineyards um, over the weekend, and there's tons of people from Atlanta just go up and do road trips there. Lots of outdoor activities. So yeah, it's it's an amazing area. Love it a lot. Yeah, I took my, my wife Melissa and I just had our anniversary, and we we went up to the Ritz Carlton there, and they have a just this really cool thing where they do a kind of a fire pit way off away from the regular resort, and they they golf cart out a bunch of pre-cut up food and they have a chef come out and prepare dinner and you're sitting right on the lapping edge of the lake and nice. full moon and beautiful sky. I mean, it's really beautiful country. I think people don't really appreciate how amazing it is out here. Um, especially if like me, you're from the West coast or Northwest area. It's sort of, you feel like the East coast is all developed and mm -hmm. full of buildings. You get out here and you find out, nah, not like that at all. Yeah, Lake Burton's just north of you guys. I think that's one of the, the most beautiful lakes probably in the country. Well, I'll tell you, Sam, sometime you got to come down here south of Atlanta, which is where we moved to recently. Mm -hmm. We were north of Atlanta, and um, we had a 300-some acre farm there, and it kind of got surrounded by development. And so we got out of there, and we moved to a, a farm south of Atlanta, about 40 miles south of the airport. And I'll tell you, man, it is beautiful down here. You got to come down. You can stay at our house, and we'll we'll go out and sh I'll show you some of the backwoods country from uh, from uh, the south side of Atlanta. Oh, maybe we can jump out of an Apache helicopter while we're at it. We got we still have military connections. <laughs> no, that sounds great. We'll definitely we'll definitely get up there. We're going up right now about three or four times a year, so um, so it's great. And and it was cool. actually coincidental. I was so my dad and I were up there, and we were building. We have this little tiny floatable dock that's been totally trashed over the last decade. Uh, so we're rebuilding it. And I had on your podcast, your podcast invested. And I was listening to maybe five or six different episodes while we were rebuilding the dock. And, it, and my dad's kind of teaching me how to, you know, d do a lot of the woodwork and metal work on this. And then in my other ear, I'm, I'm listening kind of your principles on how to invest. And it was just, and it, the weather was perfect. And I was like, this is just such a cool little kind of learning and learning experience of two different types of trades. And um, it, was, it was kind of a special moment. I really enjoyed it. And I wanted to thank you for, uh, for your great content. Well, I'm, I'm really appreciate the thanks. And I, I'll tell you, we, uh, we, we got to owe the podcast to my kid, mm -hmm. um, Danielle, who is, <laughs> She sort of made that thing happen. So, yeah. yeah, I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. Awesome. Well, maybe we can get kicked off. Just I wanted to share a little bit of your background with our listeners. Uh, we, we touched on a little bit of your military experience, but you have a really interesting, not childhood, but, you know, kind of college, post-college area. And I just wanted to see if you could share a little bit of that with us. Sure. Yeah. I mean, don't all of us have an interesting childhood? We, we owe, you know... 10 years of therapy to our family. So, <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> my family's a real kind of blue collar family, uh, you know, railroad union guys and everything. And, and we never had any money at ever. And, and so it was never kind of part of my future that I would be involved in money in any way. So the only, the, I, it's just, a, you know, this sort of idea of Dharma where you sort of find your way into your path in life. And all of a sudden everything starts to roll kind of happened to me. I think, um, I was a, uh, after the military, I got out and, and started guiding in the Grand Canyon and I was down there about 10 years and oh my gosh, I just got an email from a great old friend of mine who guided with me for years down there mm -hmm. named Boyce McClung and, and we are all getting together over Labor Day for a guides reunion from all the geezers from the seventies. <laughs> We're all geezer. We've arrived at a sort of status just by staying alive into a status of geezerhood among the, uh, the, uh, the, the guide community down in the Grand Canyon. <clears throat> and people, people are telling us that we were actually, you know, looked upon with some, some degree of respect from having done all that back there, which is such a hoot. I mean, it was the seventies, man. Mm -hmm. We were, we were definitely 1970s river guides with all that that implies. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I would have never ended up being in the, in the investing world, except that I nearly drowned some guys on our trap raft trip. And but I didn't drown them, which was the important point. And this guy said, look, man, I really owe you for not drowning us back there. And um, and I want you to come out and learn to be an investor. Mm -hmm. And long story short, I just was freezing my butt off up in Flagstaff, Arizona that winter. And I thought, you know, this guy lives in La Jolla, California. I think I'll go out there and get warm. 
And that was really the motivation. I mean, I was so not interested in being an investor. I, and, you know, realistically, how could I as making like $4,000 a year? Right. And so I, I went out just to kind of see this guy's place. And, he, you know, he's a really wealthy guy. And and dang, he, he I spent a couple of weeks there. And be, before I was done with those two weeks, I was convinced that I could actually do this. Not only that, but I would actually be interested enough in it to do it. And so I he asked me if I would apprentice and I did. So I spent a year there with him. And um and a year later, I started on my own with a, about a thousand dollars, and then I just followed the formula that that basically had come down to this guy from Warren Buffett and from Ben Graham. You know, the, what we call the ruler family that kind of follows this basic set of rules about investing. And um, man, I applied those rules, and five years later, I had my first million, and then I went on since then. And you know, it, it's. It's a it's an investing strategy that works whether you've got a little money or a lot of money, but it works really, really good if you've got a little money, which is great. Right. So that's how it, it all kind of started. That's amazing. And so you, you said that you thought you probably never would have gotten to finance without having met, met that guy. That guy became your mentor in a sense. You said apprenticeship. With, were you kind of like an intern for him for a year? Yeah, I just swept the floors and cleaned the bathrooms, you know, and and um, coming from being a guide, I didn't have any any sort of predisposition toward my own status. You know, I was just like, whatever, I'll do whatever you need. And you guys teach me to do this stuff. So, yeah, he he, be, he was my mentor. And then from there, um, I left and, and just started on my own. You mentioned in and if a lot of the listeners want to hear more about some of, more about that. The I think it's the first episode of your guys' podcast. You're kind of you and your daughter are doing an introduction to each other, and uh, a lot of the details are in that, which are really cool. You mentioned also that you guys moved to Iowa to some type of meditation oriented community after you had, had already come become successful in investing. I don't want to skip ahead, but I thought that was kind of a, a really cool early part of your life, relatively. Is that, yeah, well, is kinda, that true, it kind of came out of. It, it kind of came out of the fact that all during those those 10 years of, of uh, guiding, mm -hmm. I was, you know, tripping off to India off and on and um, and it, and was studying meditation and <clears throat> getting deeper into it, studying different kinds of meditation. And I kind of settled into this one technique that I really liked. And they had a um, sort of an American version of an ashram going in in uh, in Iowa. And as we had my wife and I had little kids who thought, you know, it'd be really great to bring them up in some sort of really alternative place, you know, that where in, in this particular place, the kids were all really encouraged to be kind of good to each other and not not be mean. And I don't know. I mean, it sounds like a small thing, but but we wanted to meditate every day. And it's hard to do a kind of a discipline like that out in the real world. And so we thought, let's let's go into this community. The only thing we're going to participate in this sort of, you know, quote, ashrams thing is twice a day we're going to go in and meditate with the group. And that was fabulous. I mean, we spent years there and and uh, it really anchored our kids in kind of a spiritual path. And mm -hmm. they're continuing on with that. And I think I think what we see from our children uh, having come up through that is that they're really independent adults and have done really, really well. And. I got I got to say that you know sometimes the path less traveled can be really good if you uh, if you keep if you keep your own independence you know Yeah absolutely I think that's why <laughs> I don't have any kids yet but that's kind of why I'm looking up in the areas we just talked about just because the the, the society in Florida has just become this really vain aggressive uh, it's just sort of unpleasant in a lot of ways after spending you know 30 years here and seeing it kind of develop and being in a lot of quieter places throughout the year and then coming back to South Florida is just like, whoom. And, you know, you get hit with oh, the yeah. billboards, who can I sue dot com, have an accident, <sighs> we'll get you money, you know, all this stuff. I'm like, Ugh, sure. I don't think I want to be around this anymore. So I thought that was really cool how you how you got kind of drawn to that community. Did you hear about that from somebody or? Well, I got I got back. I got back from Vietnam and, and was in that sort of state, you know, I'd been in the military for several years and I was in that state of that, that soldiers get into that is uh, when you come back into into normal life mm -hmm. where you're just really kind of lost. You don't know where you don't know really quite how to do it. <laughs> you don't know how to right. do normal life. Yeah. And um, and that's what sent me off toward being a river guide is that I, I sort of needed a buffer that, that lasted 10 years. <laughs> and my brother, right after I'd gotten home, my brother, um, who had been at an absolute hippie, 
uh, anti-war activist up in Washington, you know, God bless him. And, and, um, and he had started this meditation thing and I could see it was really having a, a good effect on him. And he said, Hey man, you ought to, you ought to do this. So of course I ignored him for months. And, um, and then I just happened to room. I just picked up an ad in the paper and I moved into a, a spare bedroom in a place around Marin County, uh, California, near San Francisco. And the guy that was in that house happened to be a, a meditation teacher. And so he took me to a place and I learned to meditate. It was it was sort of an organic accident. I just kind of started and I liked it and I just kept doing it. And I, that was 40 some years ago. I'm still doing it twice a day. Good for so you. that's kind of what took us in. Very cool. And I, you know, I, I think honestly that, that there's a lot of different ways you can go. I I don't want to give anybody idea that I, I'm thinking that, you know, this this uh, meditation is the right way to go for everybody. I, my wife, Melissa, doesn't she likes to meditate, but her real way of kind of getting deeper into herself is to get out in nature and just take a long walk in the woods. And for her, that's transcendence. I mean, she meditates like that. And I've I've meditated, honestly, powerful meditations just going long distance swimming in a pool back yeah. and forth and you just sort of find yourself in this zone so i think there's a lot of ways to get there contemplative prayer you know kobe bryant talks about being in the zone so does jordan i think it's a real thing and i think we really should pursue it as a as a people i mean people over in asia know about this a lot more than we do but i think transcendence is huge and i think that that if you wanted to get wealthy and you want to live a great life both you know, because they're they're they can be mutually independent a lot, a lot of the times. And, and I know a lot of miserable, wealthy people. Right. And yeah. I know I know miserable doctors and lawyers and people who have spent a lifetime training and live really good quality lives according to the standards of our culture. And yet they're miserable. Yeah. And um, and I know people who are really poor in other cultures and they're really, really happy. And so there's yeah, what we'd like to be is rich and happy. That would be good if we could do that. that Absolutely. Would be good. <laughs> yeah. We spend a lot of time over in South, in Southeast Asia and uh, it's amazing how much joy you see you, you get. Uh, that's why we essentially spend time over there just because the people have so much joy uh, and they have very little relative to a lot of, a lot of places in the world. And I, I think, um, you know, Buddhism and that, that way of life is a, a huge part of it. And what you mentioned in the, in the practice, not necessarily meditation, what I've always found is like you said, swimming or riding a motorcycle or listening to music and kind of open space mm. also give me that same kind of very present feeling. So those are, those are three things I try to do, if not two or three of them a day, but try to definitely do one a day just to get in that transcendence mood. Oh man, I think that's fantastic. I uh, really do, Sam. I, I mean, and it, I think the reason we can approach it on a motorcycle or music or or meditation or prayer is that it's it's everywhere. I think we're sort of tapping down into an infinite space, which means it's everywhere. We're sort of made out of it, which makes it quite accessible if you just point your attention that way in a way that works for you. Um, you're gonna you're gonna find your way in there. I mean, my son Hunter is a <laughs> not surprisingly a hunter yeah. and a fisherman and when he was just 10 years old he was up in a tree stand with me and I'm, we're we're up deer hunting and he's uh, and I, I i would see this kid i mean like I, one of my other boys is like up there and i could i know what he's doing he's up there playing video games on his phone <laughs> right because it's five in the morning and and i think hunter's asleep but he tells me no i'm not asleep i'm actually just I've got my eyes closed, but I'm awake inside. This is a ten. This is a ten year old. Mm -hmm. I'm awake inside, and I, I said, so what are you? Th are you thinking about anything? He goes, no, I'm not thinking about anything. He said, but I said, you're, but you're not asleep. You're not dreaming or anything, right? No, no, I'm just, I'm just awake inside. I mean, that is a textbook description of transcendence. Yeah. You know, where you just. You're not thinking anything in particular, but you're sort of in this space. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's right there. I mean, it's just for Hunter, it was just instantly accessible. He's a lot like his mom. It's just sort of there. But I think if you look for it, as you do, you know, every day, grab a little of that. I think what it's doing is it's kind of bringing something infinite into your life. And with that infinity comes a kind for for me and my family anyway, what we've experienced for 40 some years of this is that you bring a little of that in every day, just a few minutes and it brings bliss in. I mean, you sort of, you get more centered, which is great, uh, you know, be here now and all that. But really, the powerful piece of this thing is that you are, you're feeling happier. 
for no reason, right? So mm -hmm. it's just a little, what, what they say over in India is that this experience of transcendence is an experience of absolute bliss consciousness. That, that so there's, it's consciousness, but it has a quality of bliss. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that'll, that'll keep you doing it for 40 years right there. Wonderful. Well, it's great to hear a lot about your work-life balance philosophy. It's definitely something that I know Johnny and I are trying to continuously put more and more into practice. Uh, is it's easy to get, to get caught up in uh, super a type personalities just try to go 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 and, and forget about you know taking a moment to stop and just kind of be present and um i wanted to kind of go back this sounds like a really naive millennial question but you when you first started trading i imagine that was back or investing rather i imagine that was back in the late in the 70s or right 1980 is when i started 1980s so that yeah. was sort that was pre-internet right um for, oh, the yeah. most, for the most part so how like <laughs> We think of, of investing generally all enabled by the internet. How how were those oh, first man. investments conducted? Sam, it's such a different world. Honestly, <laughs> you're going to feel like I'm just taking you back into the Stone it's, Age. I'm ready for I'm ready for I a mean, history lesson. For, first off, think about this. Like right now on the internet, we have access to so much information for investing, and um, most of it's free. You know, I mean, we we have to pay a little bit for this and that, maybe a few bucks a month or something. But in general, it's mostly free. All right, come back to 1980. The the main source of information about a company that was public was from a company called Value Line, which published this book that looked like what you'd have as an airline pilot with a, you know, it's got the three ring binder and they keep sending you new pages and you open the three ring binder and you take out the old pages and you put in the new pages mm -hmm. and you, and this information is coming to you, you know, weeks after the events. And for me, when I was starting, I had no money and that's fairly important back then because $50,000 a year is what Value Line was charging for its services. Wow. $50,000. So I couldn't, you know, that was, forget that. So how else can I get the information? Well, these guys had the information in their investment shop. But later when I started on my own, I had to go down to the library and get it out of the library. So everything was old and ancient information and would require weeks to get new information. So if I wanted to just, let's say, real quickly, just scan what a company does and their balance sheet and their income statement, just look at some of the numbers, I would have to send them a letter or call them and ask them to mail me something and it would come in a couple of weeks and I would get it. I mean, now that information is instant. I mean, I can do more in three or four minutes than I used to be able to do in weeks of work. Wow. So what this has done is it's democratized the investing uh, process, at least in our style of investing, where we're really long-term investors fundamentally, and we're looking for information about companies and looking for where we can, you know, how we can figure out what they're worth, and and then when the market fluctuates and puts them on sale, we buy them. So we we gather that data and then study it, and oh my God, it's just it's just changed everything. It's made it possible for the little guy like me to do this starting right now with, with no money, no hard work. I mean, I can do in 15 minutes a week what it used to take me all week to do back 30, 40 years ago. That's nuts. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, it... of all the impacts of the internet, I, I, I'm I sure there are more profound ones than this. I mean, you think about you know communication and millennials, everybody's communicating yeah. in a really different sort of way than before. And and the internet has just wreaked havoc on industries. It's wreaking havoc on on the television industry and movie industry. All these things are going through huge changes. But the investing industry, let me tell you, man, they used to charge. So first off, information used to be, one, slow to get, and two, really expensive if you wanted to get it any quicker. Yeah. And the other thing is that if you actually were to buy something, they would literally charge you. These brokers would, there was no internet online brokerage. There was no discount brokerage. There was just go down to Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch or wherever, Schwab or something. And you go down there and they charge you about 1% of the cost of the whole trade, which, you know, doesn't sound like much. But if you buy and go in and then you sell and come out, you've paid 1% going in and 1% oh coming out. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So so 2% of anything you do on each trade is gone. 
right? And if you think about it, if you're just a general broad market investor and you're making five or six percent a year and you're giving away two percent a year, yeah, you're giving away thirty three percent of your upside. Wow. And uh, I mean, and that adds up. So anyway, that the the democratization of fees is the other thing that's radically changed um, yeah. on a couple of different ways. The, the number one thing was that now we can do a trade for a penny. It used to be many, many, many dollars. And second, that the, uh, the, the, the little guy now has a way to invest on his own where because the commissions came down so low, these big institutional companies like Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch, they don't even want to deal with the little guy anymore. They yeah. they used to be happy to have your business because you got charged just like everybody else. But now they don't make anything. If you have under a hundred grand, they don't even want to talk to you. It's like forget it, you know? Which is actually good, but most yeah, people right. feel feel offended. So it seems like things were easier in some ways now and harder in some ways. Easier it's just you have so much information readily available and it's easy to to invest and make trades. But it seems like also because of that, there's a lot more people doing it, uh, but maybe it's just easier. I don't know. What, what's your what's your opinion? Because if there's a lot of people doing it, there might be a lot of people doing it the wrong way, which provides more opportunity. Precisely. In fact, the beauty of, of what's going on right now is that almost everyone is doing it the wrong way, <laughs> which isn't, it's, this isn't just me telling you that. It's that one of the really lucky things that happened to me was that this guy that taught me came out of this tradition uh, from Ben Graham and Warren Buffett that um, believes that you can find bargains in the stock market if you're patient and if you do your homework, that the stock market doesn't price everything properly all the time, that sometimes enough fear comes in there from some sort of economic weather that pours in every 10 years or so, you, you get this big economic storm and that creates a lot of fear and the fear causes smart people to sell stuff cheap because they want to get out and get liquid. And when that happens, if you have resources, you you go outside with a wash tub, man, because it's raining gold. Yeah. And and if, so we learned to do this. Now, the, the amazing thing is that since about when I started to invest, Three Nobel Prizes have been given to economists for creating a theory of investing that's used now by almost everybody else, including virtually every financial advisor, virtually every mutual fund. All the indexes are run on this basis of, called modern portfolio theory. And it, it's very widely accepted in all the universities. And what it says is you can't find a bargain in the stock market. Everything is priced exactly where it should be. Everyone in the stock market is rational. No one trades based on fear or greed. Everything is done really, really rationally. And the only way you can make a lot more money is to take a lot more risk. And this is just absolutely, obviously false, right? And in what other market on the planet is, are everybody rational? I mean, you go to a garage sale, not everybody's rational. You can buy mink coat at a garage sale for a hundred bucks mm -hmm. that that person paid ten grand for, mm -hmm. right? They're just dumping it. So the idea um, that everyone in trades on right now is called modern portfolio theory. It uses the efficient market hypothesis. It's taught in every business school, and up until just recently, I mean, literally up until 2010. It was the academic standard. And then Danny Kahneman um, and Amos Tversky from Israel got the Nobel Prize in, in behavioral economics for showing that in this market, people, people in general do not behave rationally all the time. So that's a first huge breakthrough. And then in 2013, Robert Schiller at Yale got the Nobel Prize for proving that the stock market is irrational from time to time. Cool. So now there's an, an a just recently, it's just starting to happen, is a new paradigm that says that Warren Buffett has been right all this time, big surprise, mm -hmm. who and, he, and he's been saying for 50 years that this modern portfolio theory is nonsense and that, the, you know, thank God, because, you know, it's the reason why so many smart people do so many dumb things. And because they do, Buffett said he, that's how he got rich. And so it, back to your question, we we have such a huge advantage in the market now with the vast majority of people investing as if everything is priced properly. If we know it's not and can find those situations where it's clearly not, we can make a very high rate of return with very low risk in spite of what doctrine says. Love it. So 
going back to everything that you have is branded kind of based on the rule, the number one rule of investing or rule one of investing. And that is that basically don't lose money. Is that the the number one rule? That is. And and it comes from two rules that Buffett said are the only two rules of investing. Rule number one, don't lose money. And rule number two, don't forget about rule number one. Uh So, and the, the, the thing he's been saying this forever and people think it's trivial along the lines of buy low, sell high, you know, like, Oh, if only I could, but it's not trivial. Um, another way to think about this same rule was put out by one of my favorite investors, um, a guy who runs a hedge fund, a billion dollar hedge fund named Monash Pabrai. So this Indian guy, he lives in um, Newport Beach, phenomenal fan of Warren Buffett's. And Monash actually had another friend of mine named Guy Spear paid a million dollars to go have lunch with Warren Buffett just so they could say thank you, wow. which is really awesome. And, uh, and so Monash said that what Buffett means by that, like the rule is don't lose money. What he means is you wait on, until you can buy what Monash calls a free lottery ticket. You're, you're getting something where if you don't win the lottery, the minimum thing that happens to you is you get your money back. Mm-hmm. And if you can invest in free lottery tickets, eventually one of them may hit and you get really rich. But the key is that none of them fail. None of them are going to cost you anything in the long run. So when you when you watch Warren Buffett on TV and you're aware of this idea that what he's thinking about is what he's buying is our free lottery tickets. You watch him on TV on CNBC and he talks about, OK, we just started buying John Deere. Um, John Deere Tractor Company. Mm -hmm. And the interviewer says, well, why are you buying John Deere Tractor Company, Warren? And he says, because it'll be worth more in 10 years. So that means if he, if he pays, let's say $80 a share for John Deere right now, in 10 years, he's very comfortable. He's going to get at least 81. Right. Okay. So he doesn't know, maybe it's going to be 801, but it's definitely going to be 81. And that means he's got this lottery ticket that isn't going to cost him anything. Now, the key to that is you have to have control of your capital and you have to be super patient and you have to wait in cash and you can't just buy stuff every day like every other fund manager out there trying to make a success over the next quarter. Mm -hmm. Buffett doesn't think in quarters. He thinks in decades. And that's a huge difference uh, in how you go about investing. That's why I feel like I get, I've get i gotten burned so many times in the past is just because I grew up in an age where and, – and started investing in an age where it's too easy to get in and out of investments in a sense. So mm-hmm. you know, I grew up watching Jim Cramer and the market's green and I want to buy and the market's red. And I don't have any principles. I'm just, you know, I'm just a college student trying to, to make investments. And I think because of that immediate access and not having a good foundation for knowing how to invest, just made tons of mistakes in my, you know, early mid twenties, which have all been good lessons going along the line, but um, but almost, you know, getting being have, having too much accessibility was almost a bad thing for me. It is a bad thing. It's it's as if you have, um, I mean, think about investing the way we invest in real estate, right? I mean, we're we're gonna or a farm. I love f- the idea of buying a farm. I've got one out here, and I've had farms other places in California and Iowa. Mm-hmm. And I, and you buy a farm, you're not thinking about you know, hey man, I'm gonna get out of this tomorrow. You know, it's it's like you're in it. You you bought the farm, and now you got this thing yeah. that you own for a long time. And so when you buy into it, you don't buy into it with the expectation that you're going to unload it in a week or two. And so you imagine if you were buying a farm and you have a guy who's the farmer on the next right over the fence is this guy with another farm. And all he does all day long while you're out there farming is shout prices at you about what he'll pay for your farm all day long. Mm -hmm. Every minute he's changing the price, right? It could make you completely crazy. It can make you start to think about, wow, I need to sell this farm. Or, oh, <laughs> yeah. I need to buy a farm. You know? I'm tired instead of shoveling of, sand. <laughs> exactly. And I'm going to become a trader instead of a farmer. And that kind of thing is exactly what happens, of course, in the market. You know, you've got this mis- – we call we call the stock market Mr. Market, Sam. Mm-hmm. It's We think of him as a guy who is manic depressive, 
person who goes swinging from one extreme set of emotions, manic and, and overly exuberant and greedy, all the way down to the other end of the scale, which is massively depressed. Right. And, and, and we think most of the time Mr. Market is on his meds and is reasonably rational. But he gets off his meds and can get into these modes and and these – these are these moods and these moods can can cause him to provide you with pricing that is really crazy in one direction or the other. Um, he can say, I can price these things really, really high. Like a, a, a crazy example is a Yahoo at one point was priced at 11,000 PE, a PE of 11,000. That means that if if the earnings don't grow in Yahoo, it would take 11,000 years to get your money back. <laughs> Right? And if the earnings did grow at a rate that would make that a reasonable investment, you would discover that in 10 years, Yahoo would be the single thing all of GDP was devoted to. There would wow. be no money spent on food, gasoline, housing, not healthcare, nothing. All you would have was Yahoo stock trades so or Yahoo advertising trades. So it, it, the market can be insane about how it's pricing things when it gets greedy. And then when it gets depressed, it can be equally insane mm. where you're, you're giving chance. Like, like in 2009, we got out of the market and I got out, I got, I went on CNBC in 2007 and said, look, I'm, I'm just, the market's way too expensive and I'm getting out. And at that point in time, people onto the show on Maria's show were saying, yeah, well, how do you know where the bottom is? How do you know where the, how are you going to get back in? That's the big catch of getting out is you don't know when to get back in. And I said, well, I'll get back in when when the prices are really, really good and the big guys are starting to get back in. And and so in 2009, I started getting back in and I, I went back on and said, I'm getting back in. And they said, well, how do you know where the bottom is? And I said, I don't know where the bottom is. You know, the market's at 6,700. Maybe it's going to 2,500. I don't yeah. know. What I know is that I can buy Chipotle Mexican Grill right now for $55. I can buy Whole Foods for seven bucks. Mm -hmm. um, these are great companies and I want to own them and I've owned them in the past and I want to own them again. And when you buy companies, when the market is super depressed like that, you have this asymmetric gain potential. Like the downside is very little and the upside is humongous. And, and Whole Foods went from, from $7 up to about, I don't know, 50 or so. And I think I sold it at 49. And, um, and Chipotle Mexican Grill went from 55 all the way to 750. And, you know, dumb me, I, I got out of it about 550 because I thought it was crazily high price then. So um, these things have the potential to generate 80% per year compound and annual growth rates once you've you've waited in cash and were able to buy in. But the catch is, Sam, most most people who are investing or who are managing other people's money have no way they can wait in cash for 18 months. They right. can't do it. Gotcha. You want to hear something crazy? Yes, I do. I love crazy things. Right now, right now this very minute, Warren Buffett has stored away – more than twice the amount of cash he had available the last time the market crashed. He now has $90 billion in cash sitting there, Ooh. $90 billion sitting there. And just a few weeks ago, he wrote a letter to all of the shareholders of Berkshire and said, you know, every 10 years an economic storm comes along and when that happens, you really want to get out of wash tub because it's going to rain gold. And so Warren's got his $90 billion wash tubs ready and um, and every 10 years, economic bad news comes. Well, you know, the last economic bad news started in 2008, and here we are in 2017. So I think one of the best investors in the world is pretty clearly signaling that you ought to be outside with a wash tub full of cash right now. <laughs> Man, Phil, this is this episode is going to mess me up. I don't know what I'm going to do uh, when we get off this call. We had, we had Harry Dent, who's an author economist, on a few episodes back, and he's calling for Dow Jones 4,000. And I'm just like throwing my hands up in the air. I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, am I, am I supposed to try to play this or... I mean, if no, 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 don't do, don't go that way. Don't play it. Here's the thing. Harry Dent is a, is a really interesting guy. I don't know a lot about his stuff, but he's got these really, a lot of people like his theories. He's worth reading. Um, but there's another guy out there named Ray Dalio who mm -hmm. runs money. And sometimes when you're actually managing money, um, you know, you have, you, you, you have to be responsible to what's actually going on in your account. Right. And Dalio is, has one of the largest hedge funds, if not the largest one in the world. His compounded annual growth rate for 34 years or longer is 18% per year, Sam. Oh. But this guy's brilliant. Um, and he 
is out there right now saying stuff that's different than Harry Dent, but in the same general direction. And that is that we are at the end of an economic super cycle Mm -hmm. that that this started in the early 1930s as the depression bottomed. And now we're at the other end of it where we have extended credit and then gone through multiple recessions. But the overall extension of credit has gotten so huge that the only way back now is a serious rebalancing. Mm -hmm. And Ray is basically, he's not saying like Harry Dennett's going to be a market 4,000. He's basically saying it's possible that the Federal Reserve, the federal government, with a combination of fiscal and monetary policy, can slide us along this very narrow path, you know, between hyperinflation and and a serious depression, and rebalance in a beautiful way. And he's hoping to help that process and hoping that we can do that in a wise sort of way. And I have to give major kudos to Bernanke and Yellen, you know, mm-hmm. of, of managing us through the crisis that started in 2009, which probably without their uh, their oversight in the Federal Reserve would have sent us into that depression. Now, the question is, we you know, we've been taking, we've been taking chemotherapy for the cancer, mm-hmm. um, how do we get out of the chemotherapy without killing ourselves? Right. Like if we cut it off too soon, we die of cancer. We keep taking it like this, we die of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So it's a, what Ray is saying is just this very narrow winding path that nobody knows really where it is. They've got to find their way through it. And if they do, we'll come out the other side without a worldwide depression or without, without a huge inflation, without war, you know, we'll get to the other side of this. This is not to say it ain't dangerous. It is dangerous. And right now is a really important time, I think, for people to know how to invest because the idea that you can leave your money in the market in a broad market fund, widely diversified the way virtually all of your financial advisors are saying you Mm -hmm. should behave is failing to realize that when we hit the when we hit the skids on on these economic storms, your portfolio, no matter how balanced, no matter how risk averse, that baby's going down like a brick. And the problem is it may not come back up for quite a long time. And by quite a long time, I mean easily 10 to 15, even 20 years before right. it recovers. Now, I, I hate to say it, but that's exactly the time frame when investors who do what Graham and Buffett and Munger and all these really good investors do – that's when they're going to make billions and billions of dollars. So I, I learned on your episode two of Invested about those the kind of four principles, and they seem very simple. They're under kind of you need to understand the business. That business needs to have some type of practical advantage. There needs to be good managers, and it has to be a a, a fair to or a good to fair price. And those those seem simple. I, if I did I get those right. Yeah. Okay. Good awesome. job, man. Um, well done. Yeah, I'm learning. I told you, <laughs> learning how to how to how to draw uh, screws into wood and learning how to invest at, at the same time. But so it, those seem seem simple in theory, but I'm sure they take you know you have to have a, a keen eye at, to be able to look at financial statements and and analyze these things. So for the average person that is in the market, um, may only have a couple of hours a week. Are these things that you can really apply, or is the better way to do it? Maybe to invest in a hedge fund such as yourself or buy value ETFs or maybe just look at what Buffett's buying and buy the same things he does when he does. Well, let's start with that last one. Um, The University of Nevada, Las Vegas ran a a study on buying what Buffett's buying in the month that it became public on the last day of the month at the highest price of that day. Just buy it and then sell it under the same rules. And they ran it from 1976 to 2006 and found that if you'd done that, you would have made 24.6%. And if you were you were um, putting $5,000 away every year in like a IRA or Roth IRA and putting it through that investment process, your $5,000 a year over that 30-year period, which is what, $150,000, would have become $18 million. Uh, yeah. So, so copying Buffett is not a horrible idea. Now, the problem with copying Buffett is that he's he's really, um, really big. He has a huge amount of money under management. And, um, and I think you can do better. You can do, I mean, you can't do better than 24.6% per year. Don't get me wrong. Right. That's stunningly humongous. But that's Warren Buffett from 1976 when he was much, much smaller, much less money under management. And the opportunities were humongous in the 70s. Um, now, if you start today 
and Buffett's dealing with Berkshire Hathaway. Your guru is 86 years old. His favorite partner is 93, mm -hmm. Charlie Munger. And they they may not be there for the next 10 years that you're going to need them to be making the calls, right? So first off, I would say the idea is great, Sam. We should copy the best investors. Yeah. And, and there are a handful who are Warren Buffett type investors. And I mentioned a couple of them already, Guy Spear, Manesh Pabrai. And the thing is, you can find what they're buying and selling on a 90 day basis now because of the rules that they've made with the SEC. So you can definitely copy these guys. But the problem is when they buy stuff, they actually hope it's going to go down. And if you buy what they're buying and then it goes down, it's going to scare the crap out of you. You're going to think, what the hell? Maybe I just did. Maybe this guy's just for the first time in his life, not going to be successful. And here I am. Right. I'm, I'm copying him. So you I believe you need to know what it is you're buying. So number one, yes, copy them. Number two, copy them on the companies that you understand. Right. And apply these four things to. Does this company have a durable competitive advantage? Well, if Buffett's buying it, you can rest assured it does. Does it have good management? If Buffett's buying it, you can rest assured to the best of his ability it does. So those two things get check marked. Mm -hmm. Then margin of safety, you need to know how to figure out what the value of the business is. And believe me, it's not hard. These things are made to be hard by academics. But the way we do it, the way Buffett does it is not hard. It's, it's hard on... 90% of the companies you'll look at, but on 10% of the companies, the ones you really do understand, the way we way we think of it is it's just like you're jumping over a six inch bar. It, if it isn't that easy, then you're probably in something that's too hard for you to invest in. Mm. But there's lots of six inch bars when the market crumbles. So as the market goes down, the number of things that are easy to spot that are great companies and they're cheap goes exponentially up by a factor of 10x. So right now, terrible time to be trying to figure stuff out. It's it's really hard right now because the price of the market is so screaming high. Mm -hmm. And um, and boy, I'll tell you what, anybody that says it's not is smoking something. Um, <laughs> the, the relationship between the price of the overall stock market, which is the Wilshire 5000, and, and gross domestic product for America, which is all the, the stuff that we sell, everything we sell, goods and services, all stacks up, right? And when when the Wilshire is valued at, you know, 70 or 80% of GDP, mm -hmm. that's a pretty good time to be investing. I mean, some in the 1970s is with, is with 20 and 30 and 40% of GDP, okay? But when it gets up above 100%, you're playing with fire because you've got a stock market that's priced higher than the stuff it's selling. Right. So, all of a sudden, you got problems, right? In, in, in 1929, it was way too high. In, in 2000, it was way too high. In 2009, it was way above 100. Right now, it's as high as I've ever seen it in history. It's at 140% of GDP. Wow. I've never seen it this high. So I don't know how this market can continue to go up. I mean, it can be irrational for a couple more years. Mm -hmm. But we're really more or less like in the roaring 20s right now with this screamingly high stock market and everybody's invested in it and where else are you going to put your money? And man, I'm telling you right there, that's that's one of the big red flags is that the Wilshire GDP is at 140%. You are looking at the end of a big, big, big cycle. And I think that for one reason, Harry Dent says watch out. For another reason, Ray Dalio says watch out. For another reason, Warren Buffett says watch out. I mean, you got to pay attention to these guys wow. and, and, and see about protecting your retirement. Now that's alarming. So, so does that mean that you're relatively not and not as busy right now, but as soon as there's a pullback or something, you'll start getting really busy because things will start looking really good? Well, strangely, um, it's it's funny how little time really good investing takes. Like I have made a watch list of, I don't know, there's probably 20, 25 companies on it. And these are companies I've studied I've read about them. I've read their 10Ks. I've, st I've read books in the library. I've just done the stuff that you would do if you were going to buy that company, like for real. You, that was the only company you were going to buy. You'd study it. And, and you put it on your list of things you want to buy. And I know what price I want to pay for these things. So when the market starts to crash, really, there's not a lot for me to do except pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. Right. All the work has been done before. I'm just going to harvest. I'm harvesting the crop when, the, gotcha, when the market gotcha, crashes. Yeah. Now, in between, though, between now and when, when the market actually goes back down, I am trading. 
And this is exactly what I've learned from my teacher and from Warren Buffett. When you don't have opportunities to buy great companies that are on sale, which is very limited right now, Mm -hmm. then you want to do something to create cash flow. And so we use the same tools that Ed Thorpe used, that Warren Buffett uses, and we get into the options market in very high probability options. Like our track record is something like we'll have 90 to 95 wins and, you know, five to 10 losses over the course of a year. And of course, when you're playing that kind of a game, you have to control your losses very carefully. And we do. Mm -hmm. But that's what we do to create cash flow while the market just sucks is we just. And so strangely, now's when I'm working to try to generate decent returns for my portfolio through trading. That's Mm -hmm. a lot more work than just hanging out, waiting for, you know, a great company to go on sale. Very cool. So and I know with Rule One Capital, is that your hedge fund or is that just kind of like a parent company? Yeah, that's the actual uh, hedge fund. And I know you also do a lot of teaching between you have a book, you have the podcast, you have a great website. I think you also do events. Is is that all the different ways if people are interested in learning through you and your organization can can kind of get started? Yeah, um, we we do have all those different ways people can learn, and um, and they're all free. I mean, what what we're doing is trying to spread the revolution that you can actually do this yourself, and we think the timing's pretty good, particularly for people of my generation, people right behind my generation who have, you know, twenty years or less, and they want to be comfortably retired, and there's no way to get there through doing anything except being more uh, active with your investing. So we want to teach you how to do it right. Um, yeah, we have we have a three day thing we do once a month um, down here in Atlanta. Um, if you guys come to us, you know we we put up a scholarship and you can do it. We used to teach it for like four thousand dollars for the three days, and mm-hmm. we just thought, you know what, let's let's just give it away. And we don't sell anything there, Sam. We don't even talk about anything else, and except just learning to invest. And actually, we do talk about other things. We talk about exactly some of the stuff we've talked about today. Mm-hmm. Things like you know, getting, getting committed. Um, and how do you go about doing that? Um, man, I'll tell you, I've, I was so fortunate in my life early on to have great mentors. And I've, I've worked personally with guys like Dr. Jonas Salk, um, Steve Jobs, and the things that you can learn from these icons is unbelievable uh, about uh, that, that apply to investing that aren't about investing. They're about making commitments to where you want to be, um, what does a commitment look like compared to, let's say, uh, a goal or an intention? Mm-hmm. Um, and these guys have a different view, a lot of them, on what that is. Um, Jonas Salk, for example, is a or was a I mean, a, a lot of people don't even know who he is. He, he developed the Salk polio vaccine, saved the lives of millions of people and was the most famous scientist in the world in the 60s and 70s. And um, and what he did that was so unbelievable is he figured out how you could use a dead virus to create an effective vaccine. Mm-hmm. Nobody thought you could do it. And Salk said, look, it, it's all about commitment. It, until you fully commit, nature cannot move in your direction. You've, you've, you're holding away all the gold in the world that could come to you in ways you could never espe- expect because you're not fully committed. You're waffling. You have doubt. What you have to do is you have to be fully committed. This is from Dr. Salk. You have to be fully committed. You have to burn the ships. And when you burn the ships to go toward this magnificent, big, audacious goal that you're going after, that's when nature starts to move in ways you can't even begin to imagine. And that is, Sam, I'm telling you, man, that's one of the great secrets of life Mm -hmm. that I learned early on and, and has been instrumental in, I think, in a lot of the things that I did to become successful. That's great. Really powerful stuff, Phil. And just on a personal level, how much do you read? Do you read? Are you an avid reader in either finance or other things? I am an avid reader. Um, I wasn't an avid reader, but I am an avid reader. Um, this is one of the things I learned from this family uh, of investors that goes all the way back, that all of them are avid readers. I mean, somebody asked at a hedge fund conference, they asked Manesh Pabrai how much time he spends managing his hedge fund, right? And his wife was there standing by this lovely lady and she bent forward and said, he spends 0.1 person. Like that's it. Manesh spends about a 10th of a day Uh on his investing. But what she didn't mention is he's also an avid reader. 
So what you learn to do is to read a lot and, and you know, you see something that's interesting, like let's say a Whole Foods because you somebody tells you to go there for a grocery store and, and wow, here you are with all these really committed people and they love what they're doing and the store is really cool and, and you start to read and you just keep reading until that particular investment has either gotten to be clearly too hard over my head, can't figure it out, or I don't like the company, in which case it's a no, but I'm going to keep reading about that and learn that industry until I can say, yeah, I, I understand this well enough that I can invest in it. And here's the price I want to pay. And most of the things that I read end up in my too hard box. You know, it's like I would say yeah. at least 90 percent. I'm either going to say no or it's too hard. Easily 90 percent, maybe if, more. If you could only read one financial or investing style publication regularly, do you have a do you have a personal favorite that you think gives you the most available information? Oh, yeah, I do. I, I think the most condensed, best publication out there is Barron's. Okay. It's a it's a it's pretty much a weekly thing. They add stuff to it through the week now on the internet. But for what I do, you know, I think they highlight possibilities that are there better than the Wall Street Journal and better than the New York Times, better than the Financial Times. I think they're fabulous. And, they, it, and it's so condensed and it's all often some of my best ideas come right out of there. Awesome stuff. So I have one final question, Phil. Uh, Snapchat just went public IPO, seventy billion dollar valuation. I think. Right. Are you are you a buyer? Well, think about the basic rule here. I mean, if you were to think about our investing strategy, if you had to know one thing, what I would suggest that you know is, will that be worth more in ten years than it is today? So you say, okay, I'm going to pay seventy billion dollars for it right now. It's Snapchat, right? And can I make a, a reason if I was to think about this in this way, I'm going to buy one company for the rest of my life, for my family's life, and I'm going to pay 70 billion and that is a, and that Snapchat is the one I want to buy. Is there anything else out there for 70 billion that you'd feel like you'd be more secure about owning mm -hmm. um, for the next 10 years than Snapchat? Um, and for me, you know, I would have to evaluate what what is it that's going to keep them around for 10 years? It's going to be kind of a Twitter where it goes up like crazy and then starts to slide down and maybe it'll survive. Maybe somebody will buy it. Is there something I know about that because I'm deep in the technology world that makes me know with great certainty that that's going to be worth more than $70 billion in 10 years? Mm -hmm. And if I can't say that, then no, I can't buy it. And it's, it's really hard to do that when they're not generating any revenue, right? Amen, brother. <laughs> I don't know how you would say that about Snapchat. I'm not. I'm leaving it open that somebody could know this industry well enough to be able to say, "Oh, that's a steal." But it certainly isn't me. That would go in my too hard box in a heartbeat. Man, this has been a really powerful, informative episode, Phil. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. I'm looking forward really to sharing this with the listeners, getting their feedback, and directing them to more of your content. We would love to get to that. Atlanta event at some point. Is that something you're doing every single year? Yeah, we do it. We do it. We try to do it once a month and it fills up. Believe me, we have mm -hmm. people coming from all over the world. Usually there's people from 20 or 30 com countries because we, we hold it to only 300 people each time so we can really teach a good class. And I also am helped by um, dozens and dozens of volunteers who, who we've taught, people we've taught who are professionals. They can take a little time off, you know, airline pilots, CPAs, uh -huh. lawyers who come and actually help coach this class. So I can only do it once a month, but, um, we would, if you want to get there, you can, you can go to rule one investing.com, uh, forward slash invest like a boss. Mm -hmm. And we've got a link in there for you to, to find out more information about the class. Thanks for setting that up. Yeah, we'll leave links to all this in the show notes for the listeners. Phil, anything else you want to leave the listeners with before we sum up this, the episode? Oh, man, it's a great podcast. I really enjoy listening to you guys. And I think that, um, you know, if you follow what the best investors in the world do um, and you, you're willing to learn about it, you can change your financial destiny in an amazingly short period of time. And even more, you can create generational wealth for your family. And I think that's what really turns me on, Sam, is that we're seeing that start to happen for people. So appreciate the opportunity to talk about it, man. Love this stuff. Phil, you're the man. We appreciate it. Thanks. That was a good episode. That was awesome. Phil is awesome. Yeah, he sounds like such a cool guy. Like, I, I really want to go hang out with this guy in his ranch in Atlanta, which sounds amazing. You know what? Let's, let's, 
let's just shake on it. Let's get there for I'm gonna say by the end of this year, maybe fall time. We gotta get there. His place looks awesome, and this course I'm honestly dying to get to. Yeah, I'm very curious what it is. I mean, I'm always you know leaning towards the side of skepticism if if someone can beat the market, but at the same time. Obviously, there are people out there that do beat the market, and some hedge funds do beat the market. So it's one of those things where, like, after listening to this episode, I'm so torn because part of me wants to be like, no, Johnny, just buy, you know, buy and hold index funds, just chill out, don't get too excited. But the other part of me is like, well, you know what? What he said also makes sense. There are definitely, you know, stocks are underpriced, and if you can find them, why not capitalize on that? I agree totally. And, I think that this episode just makes me realize that the biggest mistake I've ever made in investing is giving my money to be managed by bank advisors, namely UBS and Morgan Stanley, which had laughable returns, no returns over the course of three, four years when they should have had 30% returns. And if I had taken more of this approach, who knows what type of returns I could have had, 100% or something more. So I love the empowerment. I love the message of this episode. I love there's just so many takeaways. Let's go into some of the takeaways from this episode. Definitely. Uh, so actually, even before all that, I think one thing that is kind of that I just thought of is my sister actually used to work for Merrill Lynch. I don't know if I ever told you that. Mm-hmm. She was a financial advisor, and I got to hang out with her in Bali just last week, and we were, you know, talking about investing and investments. And I made a joke saying that financial advisors have no idea what they're talking about, <laughs> and for the first time, like in her life. You know, I think that maybe the the pride or the ego used to be be in the way, mm-hmm. but now she's like, yeah, I I knew nothing. They they taught us nothing about investing while as a financial advisor. Wow. Well, there is an episode on Phil's podcast, Invested, that he talks about Morgan Stanley, and that they are never actually taught investing strategies. They are taught how to sell. And I used to have an account with Morgan Stanley going back to when I was twenty one, twenty two years old. And it was, and and I immediately after I read the book, Money Master of the Game, I folded it because I did some research into the funds they had me in. I kind of fact checked everything that he had been telling me for the last few years. And I, I'm, I can honestly say it was either lies or he didn't know what he was talking about. So he just blurted something out to try to make sense. And, uh, it was, it was a very eye opening moment and obviously a big mistake, but. Now we know, and uh, we're taking taking this into our own own hands going forward. Yeah, I, I definitely would say that regardless of what kind of strategy that you guys end up doing, whether it's buy and hold index funds or Phil Town's approach, either way is probably going to be a lot better off than going through a financial advisor or you know being invested in traditional mutual funds. Yeah, agree. So, a couple of the other takeaways, man. I I have I have a lot from this episode. I I thought. Just Phil as a person and the way he delivered some of these things. Some of these things we've heard before, but the way that it was all kind of uh, encapsulated in this in this episode was really, really well rounded and came as a great uh, reminder on some of these principles, but also as a follow up to some of the episodes again, like the Wealthfront episode with Andy Rockcliffe. So, first one that stuck out to me was this type of investing works for a little money or a lot of money, but it especially works for a little money, which is great because a lot of people have a little money that they're working with. And because you're more agile and more flexible, you can you can be more maneuverable in a sense. Um, like you said in the episode, a lot of financial advisors, they can't sit on the sidelines for a year or 18 months and waiting for a move. They're, they're, they're almost forced to invest because that's what the customer and the client expects. Yeah, definitely. Because as a customer, we would never want our money just in cash. I yeah. think even in, a, in my wealth fund account, there's a section that says cash and then a question mark next to it that... You know, basically says why are you so cash in my account, yeah, yeah. and they have to answer it because a lot of people are like, I don't want that. Even though it's like point zero eight percent or something, right? Yeah. Another takeaway is Phil's not the only one saying to be wary of the markets right now. Yeah. So how many people have we heard? Smart, smart people. Not only on this podcast, but Ray Dalio, Warren Buffett, and then on this podcast we've had Phil Canella, we've had Harry Dent, we've had lots of people. Talk about the overpriced market and to be very wary, if not, you know, if not preventative in this. Um, for me, well, let's talk about are we doing anything different after this? I mean, I think there's red flags flying everywhere, but today we've said we're not going to do anything. So, I mean, another one of the, 
the kind of takeaways and points that follows this is Warren Buffett is sitting on twice as much cash now as he was back in 2008 during right. that recession and depression. I'm happy that almost half of my money's in cash because I've kind of been holding on to it and slowly dollar cost averaging, but also slowly investing just because I feel like, you know, we are due for a recession sometime soon. Mm-hmm. But the, here's the problem is I don't know. <laughs> and I don't think anyone knows. I, I think here's the problem with the economy and investment world is it's not a fair game where everything could be pointed at a recession, mm-hmm. but then the government can just say, well, let's, let's do this. And, all of a sudden, you know, the economy's boosted kind of artificially for the next yeah. five or ten years. And if you're just sitting on cash, I think it's a it's a good gamble to to hold cash because you're not going to lose money. I mean, you lose inflation, maybe yeah. two or three percent a year. Um, but who knows? I mean, inflation might skyrocket and the money might be worth less, uh, or the stock market might you know skyrocket over ten yeah. percent, and we might lose on those possible gains. So who knows? So the, Johnny and I shared our entire investment portfolios a few episodes back. And the reason that I'm not doing anything different is because I think we're pretty transparent in that episode and with our portfolios that we actually don't have that. We're not we're, we're not as risky as people assume we are. Uh, we actually have very little in, invested in the market as, as a total of our portfolio. So that's the only reason I'm not doing anything. If I was, if that was my main investment vehicle and I had a lot more uh, percentage wise in there, I would be really thinking about doing something different. But right now, the number one thing that I'm lacking is time and mental bandwidth. So I don't want to do anything that is, is going to create more, uh, more, more mind. So after I go see this event in Atlanta and meet Phil and do this stuff, I think I might, might seriously consider a different approach because this stuff seems really, really interesting. Yeah, definitely. I, I think kind of just based on, on what I know about his system so far. I would at least play with it, you know. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily put all my money in there, but I think it it sounds interesting. Um, I don't know if I told you this, but the only reason why I invest in, in Facebook stocks is because my buddy JP he told me that it was undervalued, mm-hmm. and the way he knew it was undervalued was he basically just looked at their earnings report, quarterly earnings report, and the stock price didn't go up, even though the earnings report was much higher than yeah. they projected. So just rationally and logically, he was like, well, they made a lot of money, but the stock's going to go up. Yeah. Well, why is that? There's no reason for it not to go up. So he thought, let's buy some Facebook stock. And it paid off. Right. So, so did 150 now. Oh, man. I in, got And climbing. And I'm in it for 55. So it's three times. It's a 300% return. You sound, you sound like a professional investor. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I guess, you know, Phil's system is kind of like looking for other opportunities like yes. this. Yeah. And I... I would really like to learn how to value a company, not just on the PE, but look at a lot of other factors and say, this is a good company and start to really put these things into play. Because right now, to date, not that I'm buying any stocks right now, individual stocks, but if I have in the past, it's all been on emotion. It's like Tesla, that's a good brand. It's probably got a bright future. And maybe that simple strategy works in some cases, but if you can tie in two or three more really important principles and, and, and uh, ways to value a company, you're going to do a lot better. So one other takeaway that you know was important to me and, and almost very timely to me was knowing how successful Phil has been throughout his entire life and knowing that he has found a very good, seemingly very good work-life balance, uh, which includes meditation. And I think just the, some of the general principles around how he you know, decides to live his life, how he decided to raise his kids and how he's, he's, um, you know, chosen to, to keep things in perspective as he's, as he's gone along and become more successful because we look around, there's just so many people that are wealthy and miserable, uh, in our networks, outside of our networks. And I think it's really important as you, as you continue to become more and more successful and work and life becomes a little crazier that you, you continue to put it in perspective and use tools such as meditation and you know just finding ways to uh, to balance your lifestyle more and keep it in perspective. You only live once, might as well make it a uh, a nice beautiful life. Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the reasons why he has some kind of layers and so much character is because he's been through so much. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that he was a green beret, the fact that he worked as a rafting guide, which is a very high paid job and it's, you know, it's dangerous and it's, you know, you're outdoors you're dealing with a bunch of people who their lives are at your hand. And the fact that he's been broke 
and he's been humble enough to apprentice for someone and and learn you know kind of from the ground up yeah it kind of just shows hey he's now what 70 in that range in that i don't range? know he looks like he's 45 so i hate to yeah. say he's 70 but <laughs> yeah so yeah don't quote me on his age but he's just so well-rounded yeah and i think that maybe goes into the, the big last takeaway for me was apprenticeship and this is something that we've talked about on at least a dozen episodes i firmly believe the number one way for anyone out there to get wealthy is through apprenticeship and it's the same as it was five thousand years ago if you wanted to learn how to create swords or something you go become an apprentice you work your butt off you learn from someone who's who's done it their whole life and has a a, a trade that they can they can hand off and you you make it happen and as phil did and, and as i did and as so many people have done you learn from the wealthy how to get wealthy and there's no better way to do it than through apprenticeship yeah so if i look like this guy and i was as wealthy as this guy and has had as much energy as this guy when i'm 68 like he is yep. i'm gonna be pretty happy Let's um yeah well we need to go learn his secrets let's get to let's get to Atlanta <laughs> as soon as possible yeah I think it'll be fun I mean to be like you know to be honest it's I, I I'm a big believer in education and just kind of being around smart successful people so if you guys want to check out one of his courses um it's a three day in person event you can go to rule1investing.com and you can sign up and it looks pretty cool I mean I mean obviously these events take a lot of money and time to put on so i'm sure there's something you know maybe some books or i think i know he has a software that's about 30 bucks a month but from what i what i know and you know what it sounds like he's a good guy that really genuinely wants people to be successful and he wants people to get educated with investing yeah he's had a, a pretty remarkable life and um if he can he can help other people learn you know the way that he's been successful i'm sure that that makes him a happy guy and I know that we'll be personally trying to get there. So any listeners out there that are interested in or around the Atlanta area or anyone who just wants to go from any country said some of the events have up to people from 30 different countries. Get out there. Check it out. Let us know how it goes. Johnny and I will hopefully be at one of the events in the near future. Yeah, actually, I, I took a look at their site. It looks like there's one in San Diego, too. So it seems like most of them are in Atlanta because his ranch is there. And actually, I, I would fly out to Atlanta just to I'd see be, his ranch. I'd rather go to Atlanta. Yeah, I'd rather go to Atlanta. Okay. Okay. So we'll do that. <laughs> uh, big shout out to Phil for coming on. Thanks um, you know, f- for coming on the podcast, but also for your military service. Shout out to the troops out there. And uh, anything else, Johnny? Yeah, shout out to everyone who's been giving us these amazing five-star reviews of the podcast. You guys are the reason why so many people listen in and how we can get these big-time, amazing guests who have been all over, you know, you know, TV and, and news and best-selling authors. So I want to give a big thank you to Crush It Now from the DR, Dominican Republic. Oh, right. This is a new country. Yeah. yeah. Not a new country, but a new reviewed <laughs> Brand country. Brand new country. Yeah. <laughs> just, just formed now. <laughs> Learn like a boss, five stars, so much amazing info. I'm a total newbie hustling to become an entrepreneur, and the info is easy tied to digest. Johnny and Sam. Make sure the listeners get the most of value out of each episode. Love it. Thanks for the review. So crush it now like a boss. You got your wine still, Sam? It's over here, buddy. I like it. So we are going to go out, enjoy Barcelona, enjoy mm-hmm. some Spain, and we will talk to you guys next week. Peace out. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.